waiting for all our speakers i would request all the six speakers to be present right now on the on the screen you can turn on your videos also in case you want the participants as always i look forward to the questions you would like to ask i know there was a lot of engagement that you were attempting during the while the sessions were ongoing and uh, so you can start posting the questions on the chat box or the activity section uh, you can also raise your hand and i'm sure other speakers today will be very very happy to answer them so we had the first question for Shalini Nambiar. Is it not true that highly impactful teachers are the one who are perfect in their planning? In fact, don't they plan minute to minute? Um, yeah, of course, that's what I said, the great teachers. And I think Anand also spoke about that. Uh, you need to be uh, really a great teacher. But, you know, when you're planning, it is extremely important, uh, you know, are you making the impact? So are you planning that, you know, usually like when we went to school, what would happen? A 30 minute class and the teacher in the end, which happens in 80% of the classrooms, the teacher says, okay, you do this for homework and we'll do it tomorrow. There is no time for plenary, which is such an important part of the learning. So uh, that's what the focus, of course, I agree with the, the question that impactful teachers do create a great lesson plan because if you do not have a plan, you're planning to fail. You know, you need a proper plan, what I'm going to be teaching, what are the activities I'm going to do. Most important, when you're planning the lesson, write down the questions you will ask. Because those are very important. Are they closed-ended or are they open-ended? You know, if you're not going to be having uh, asking questions to the children, I don't think so any learning is taking place. You're just giving them things without realizing whether they're understanding or no. So yeah, I, I wish the world is full of impactful teachers. And that will be the day we will have success all around. Thank you so much, ma'am. We Thank have you. a question. We have a question for Sahil Kapoor now. There is a misconception that coding is relevant for people interested in tech or taking a career in software. How do you handle this? I think, uh, sir, I think there's, he will be joining yes. us back in a few seconds. So, um, yes, sir, you're here. Did you hear the question? Yes, yes, yes. Right. This, this is the most, most common question uh, we have been receiving. And uh, in most of the demonstrations, uh, we get this question across. Uh, when, when a parent enrolls his kid for any coding course, so what they expect out of it? Most of the parents, what I came to know, they feel their kid will be an app developer after this, or he or she will be creating websites, which actually doesn't happen. And coding is not for this. Coding will be used for entire life. It is to enhance their logical reasoning, their critical thinking, enhance their skill set, their scheduling, everything. So like I said, our program, it's, it's, it's basic of coding. I'm not uh, claiming anything like that. Yeah, okay, there'll be an app developer doing this, which is actually not possible. A lot of engineers, a lot of people who have done multiple courses, uh, they haven't been able to do it. But you have to get acquainted. The kind of future is in store after 10 years. These all are teaching aids. These won't replace teachers. I completely buy the point of Shalini ma'am here. But these are necessary and necessities today. Without this, you cannot prevail. I hope I have uh, addressed the question. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You have. I think uh, back in school, you know, we were taught how to use Microsoft Excel and all those things. Not because we had to become, you know, somebody who deal with it every day. Just because it's an essential basic skills. That is what with the de development in technology, that is what uh, coding would be now. I think that is how I feel it. Uh, anu ma'am, we have two questions waiting for you actually. I'll present to you the first one. How do we inculcate the passion to love in teachers and understand the child first and then get them ready for learning? Ma'am, uh, can you hear me? Anu ma'am? 
I guess she's on mute. Uh, yes. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Hear. Right. Okay. So, uh, so I just like to address the person. This question is coming from. What's the name? The girl or a boy? What's the name for the person? Um. Ma'am, we have received the question from some of our participants. Even okay, Anna. cool. No problem. Yeah, don't worry. Okay, fine. That's okay. Is so, Shalini Mehta? Yeah. So you know, the whole thing is that this is every question. Okay. Now, first of all, it was very interesting that I heard, uh, uh, you know, the fact that teachers need to be cultivating self-love. Now. The point is this: that first of all, we have to cultivate self-love. Can you help me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So first of all, each person has to cultivate self-love, and then loving everybody, whether it's your teachers, whether it's your parents, whether it's your you know roommates, whether it's your whoever. the society so you become so much more socially responsible without even necessarily consciously thinking i have to be yeah so then the appreciation for whatever is happening in your life so first of all it has to start everything starts it is psychosomatic like yoga says and we have to inculcate First of all, the quality in ourselves. Have I answered the question? Yes, ma'am. I believe you have, and we have one follow-up question for you. How do you bring everyone to love nature? Sorry, how do you bring everyone to love nature? Yeah, exactly. Now this is very interesting because when we say self-love, now check out how now science, as we understand. is 200 years old yeah the western science that we know the yogic science is over 10000 years old and the way they have described it is incredible how they broken down even the mind and described the various windows that exist in the mind and how we can access those windows okay the similarly the body so they have actually the way they understand it's not just physiology yeah we only what we study in school biology physiology that's what we know i'm a top of i mean god i mean i, I don't know how i don't think i studied that much so it's god blessing that we became a gold medalist now i what i'm saying to you is that i was perfect in each subject but when i started yoga i was shocked I felt like such a dumbo because I just didn't know anything about how my the inside of my body actually functions. I, I didn't know anything beyond the biology and the physiology, right? Now, what is this body made of? The body comes from nature, and the five elements make this body: earth. water fire this is exactly how the chakras are so i'm just telling you exactly how if you if you see your entire spinal cord in one line you have these plexuses of energy that rotate and there's seven of them going from your coccyx to your cortex there are there are seven rounds of energy and they are rotating constantly 24/7 and they are basically we call them the elements that the body actually formed of first these elements came and then the external body the skin and flesh and limbs and all started to come what are the the elements the element the basic is muladhara chakra the lowest chakra which is the earth chakra this is what kept keeps us grounded you know how on moon people they fly but on on earth they are grounded right the gravity pulls us down right that is your the lowest chakra is the one that gets you responding to the gravity 
okay so that and that is made of earth so it is so there are colors and all then i don't want to go into details of all this that's another you know i can give you a whole lecture on that but i won't so so there is earth then there is water the next chapter is on the stand which is water now water is again it's a, it's, it's related to the moon and it's related to the sea and it's related to the water the third is your this is that is the middle chakra between the upper and the down the middle the mid path one and this is the manipur and this is fire it's a fire chakra so you know when you have like people who are very self like who are very low on self esteem and stuff like that there are certain asanas the deep yogic asanas that are done to activate their fire in them then there is above that is the air chakra so your weight your body is and then there's ether so your body is made up of nature and that's where that's why in my anupan when i made a module anupan one of the important out of four days of practice one day is practice in nature where people where, where the children go out to nature go out in the garden you know and they talk they they do asanas which are connected to nature directly like tree pose and stuff and they also talk and get a, a, acquainted to nature so nature is very 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 important and and we are made of nature you know so the closer we are to nature the closer we are to ourselves that's what i'd say thank you ma'am that was very well answered We have the next question for Dr. Amrita Gora. So, ma'am, if we can have you on screen, please. How can we instill in our child the skill of self-assessment? Now, <clears throat> of course, it'll have to be built into the system first and foremost. So, before we even instill in children, we'll have to ensure the teachers are willing to do it, and teachers are adequately prepared and supported. through the system to be able to do it right it's not it's not something that they want to do they all want to do provided they are provided all the support and the and the you know efficiency that they require they need some training for it they need some materials for it and they need so they need the all the logistical and more importantly the positive energy the 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 push the the encouragement and support now that happens when the entire team works as a community and therefore this this we call the professional learning community each teacher is a professional it can't be a top down approach it has to be it has to be from among the teachers and each one is important to the other so that becomes part of the culture in the entire school and that's what needs to be inculcated once you're able to do that and your teachers all of them almost all of them let's say are beginning to think this way children also begin to adapt children eventually and also parents very sensitively need to be sensitized because any change is tough any change needs to be built into a system kind of gradually it cannot be suddenly done when you try to do anything suddenly um, people will uh, you know it will fire back it's an already running system it has to be built in what works very well is every child knows that i want to or i need to self assess and if the child knows that my teacher and my parent is going to value this um when i do it they're listening to me when i'm saying that this is where i went wrong and this is helping me and my teacher my parent my friend is listening to me then i feel that yes this is important and then next time i'm trying the same thing which i could not do last time but i have worked on it now i'm able to do that sense of accomplishment by itself will inculcate that skill in in the child and and the environment around it learning is not about you know walls and books the learning environment is about the the culture the environment we actually create around a child where everybody is talking about something that would eventually help them develop that growth mindset that mindset which helps them uh look at their own selves very very critically 
look at their own selves objectively rather than you know just critically i mean that can have a negative connotation but by critically i don't mean that if i know that this is something that i am able to do very well and this is something that you know i need to falter i falter here and there so i need to work on this then i am being able to identify where do i falter and what do i need to work on that's being critical of myself but i am doing it very positively i know i'm going to work on that and i can i'm i'm positive because i know i'm going to get better at this too i'm not thinking i'm good at this i'm i'm bad at this i'm not thinking like that i can be good at anything if i want to i just have to identify my area of gap and work on it that is the skill that we need to build in the entire system it is not just in a child or all that and and it it emerges well when parents also work within the same community and and again for that you need to do a lot of sensitization and understand the the complications and sensitivities of the scenario and and that's how it works thank you ma'am i think uh, you know being being somebody who's been working in the field of assessments as a part of my you know work profile i absolutely understand it's always it always starts with understanding oneself and using yourself as a benchmark and then you know moving ahead accordingly because we at winwonders have known that you know each child is unique each person is unique each pe- each parenting each teaching is unique and but everything ha- unique also has a growth of development so really very very validly pointed out ma'am we have the next question for anand shrinivas So the question goes like how can value education be implemented in science subjects Yeah uh thanks so much for this uh, so what i found is generally value education becomes a little bit preachy if you do it directly so uh, uh most of the times it's parables and stories that are worked on us right like we hear stories of mythological characters being generous and just and so on uh, what i've noticed um and what we try to do is that there are stories of scientists like example there's galileo you just invented something nobody agrees with you There is a value of fearlessness in putting it out there. Your Jonas Salk, uh, you just invented a vaccine, and uh, you know what? You what is your choice right now? You can you can make it paid, you can make it free. Uh, what I've noticed is taking these case studies that organically emerge as part of your science education, bring them up uh, very softly, conveys values. Uh, I have not had too much success or interest actually in doing too much direct uh, uh, value-based conversations. I think students rightfully drawn away when we do that. Uh, but this has been surprisingly effective whether it's galileo or newton or jonas salk or indian science lots of them we can talk about yeah that's that's sort of my short answer to that yeah thank you so much we have the next question for shalini nambiar so the question goes like what should be done to make the students learn at home who are not facilitated with learned parents technology and with various other problems So, Namrata, very interesting question. And uh, why why do we want parents to be involved? Firstly, I think as a school, school needs to take care of education, and parents need to take care of life skills. And that's the way education was when we went to school, right? Um, I I don't remember my mom asking me ever what's your homework, which teacher came. So the challenge which has happened now, if you see, uh, we grew up very self confident. We had to deal with failures ourselves. We, need, we we nobody asked us you know we did homework because the teacher wanted it so if we didn't do we we bore the consequences when we went to school but today of course because things have changed so parental engagement has become a big thing and i do feel parents need to be involved but not in doing the homework not in creating the learning environment in fact when the both was uh, classes were going on i i did a session where i actually said please please do not make your home as schools you know let the child be you know like tell them you know this is the learning space for you and you're going to work here and i'm going to be working <clears throat> don't how many parents were part of the zoom class we all know what a fiasco it was you know sitting there and judging a teacher so i don't think so the fault is we as teachers why do we want to do make parents do the work we need to do it ourselves why are we shrugging away from our responsibility and that is what has happened today 
So the parents are pressurizing, the teachers are pressurizing, everybody is blaming each other, there is no trust and who's suffering? The child is suffering. So I think what we need to do is of course inform the parent, this is the level of your child, this is what you know probably tell them, encourage them to read or do things like that and don't expect the parent to do homework. I as a parent <clears throat> for 12 years if you ask me what did I do with my kids, I did their homework. Because I had to sit with them, make them do. So we need to understand the deep meaning of parental engagement. Parental engagement is not about them completing the task. Parents, you know, in a school, what happens? Some parents can speak English, some can't. That doesn't mean, I mean, my mom was eight past. We didn't have, we didn't speak English at home. But I think I speak pretty well because the school did its good job. The teachers who were supposed to be exceptional did the great job. You know, so we need to focus on that as a school. What is my responsibility if a child comes back without doing the homework? Am I ready to spend that extra hour and sit and try and understand where he's lacking? Or I'm going to start blaming the parent and say that you are not doing. What is he supposed to do? You know, like you go to a doctor and you are suffering from a disease. Doctor is not going to say go home and, you know, you, you need to cure yourself. He's going to find a cure for your problem. So the problem in the, what is happening in society is we are not taking a career, uh, you know, as a profession. We we think, uh, you know, and that's what I said. That why should I wrote a beautiful article? Uh, who should be paid? People should be paid, or parents should be paid? Because half the time, and it is a fact, <clears throat> what happens in the PTM? When I was in school, we never had PTMs. I don't remember my parents going to a school and getting a report card. What happens at the PTM? Teacher puts the entire blame on the parent. We have to find why the education system is deteriorating. It's because of this. We need to take the responsibility. We are professionals. We are educationists. If a child is not learning, it's my responsibility. Why is the child not learning? How is a parent responsible? You know, I'll just tell you a very funny thing. So my son was in grade three. I'm called. I'm like, called by the principal you come here immediately your child makes a nuisance here i i just asked a simple question how can i ensure my child is disciplined in the class when i am not there am i is it my job it's your teacher's job to make the class engaging right so we need to understand and try and create a connect with the parents which is important but don't make it like oh, if they are not teaching them what do we do if they are you know that's not i think i i don't think so i will agree with that at all it's our responsibility and we need to take it up very strongly thank you namrata i hope i was able to answer yes ma'am very well thank you now uh, we have a question <laughs> by aparna bharani pillai for dr amrita the question goes like, is qualitative feedback possible at IGCSE as A-levels? Why not is my question back again. Why do you think qualitative feedback can be not possible? In fact, IGCSE A-levels would certainly want you to do it throughout the year. You are supposed to maintain uh, those records for the whole year. And through the whole year, if you've managed to do that, then uh, the child will certainly get a better grade at the A-levels. And most of the, if you look at, uh, you know, the IB curriculum, the feedback is very qualitative in the, in the reporting detail, or rather, I would call it the progress card, as the CBSC is also now calling it, instead of a report card, the very idea of, of giving a report card, like reporting or judging a child, not done. It's a progress card. We're always in that continuous zone of progressing. We're all learning, we're all growing and every day. So there is no finish line. So why is it, uh, I mean, why would one feel that it is not possible? The minute we want to limit uh, the way we provide feedback with things like a good or a very good or like a star or like, uh, you know, some marks or anything like that, it is limited it will no longer be qualitative we are uh, also not just limiting but also providing a way or encouraging in some form some kind of comparison and not a very positive one again so that doesn't help the child is or cannot be defined by those marks the child is the child 
and there can be hundreds and umpteen qualities in that child which will not be uh, you know really defined by a number yes. the child is actually somebody human and it is a competency that we are trying to see whether the child was able to uh, you know achieve that competency not achieve that particular competency the right. so qualitative feedback will be about was this particular competency done not done it's not about the person it's about the competency it's about the process i hope i, I answered the question yes ma'am very well i believe uh, ms pillai aparna pillai had raised her hand so, ma'am could you unmute yourself and present your query yeah good evening um so uh, yes i completely agree with dr amrita uh, however um what uh, my worry is uh, eventually the child gets into a college let it be harvard or any other college here and uh, eventually they're looking at quantitative data um so uh, you know you you are certain, i mean i i understand how progressive schools have become over the years and uh, as they go into a higher education is it as progressive and uh, when they want quantitative yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yes. First and foremost, a Harvard will not look at only quantitative data. The Harvard will look at entire portfolio. And yes, so the good news is, and if you look at the national education policy and talk to any of the top universities now across the globe, and also in India, uh, the universities have started looking at more of qualitative data. multidisciplinary approaches to subject choices and these kind of things these kind of ideas have already been brought in liberal arts is already a big focus area and any uh, you know many many i am i am myself from higher education i started out there later moved into schools because i felt too late to change a lot of things for children at this stage now i want to be where uh, where the real you know where a lot more is possible um so believe me uh, this is changing and if if a child is genuinely looking at an admission at a really good college uh, then the entire portfolio which is filled with qualitative data will make all the difference any kind of any good career counselor will tell you that Thank definitely you. required and that see what have we been creating and this change in the system is much urgently needed if we went on doing what we were doing maybe since years unfortunately we were churning out a whole lot of uh, graduates or engineers and so on so forth but unfortunately a lot of people with almost no employability skills if if people are not employable and then we have to make them learn later then that creates a scenario which is not not workable and today what can quantitative data tell us only quantitative data and this is not to deny that all quantitative data is useless you will need baseline assessment and it doesn't have to be all quantitative you will still do a lot of data analysis with it but for each sub skill for for that child it is just uh, more comprehensive right and assessing not just one uh, one skill if you are teaching uh, a language for instance you cannot be judging the child or actually uh, you know coming to the right conclusion even if you are trying to judge with just testing the child on writing skills okay a question paper an answer paper will be able to test only writing and maybe some bit of reading comprehension uh, uh, the most important aspects of language are completely left out or maybe allocated 20 marks for asl kind of assessment out of uh, or 20% or something like that does that do justice no so and and then there are so many other sub skills within each aspect of reading which will not be possible to judge only through a through a certain kind of assessment so where is the skill being assessed and that is what everybody is realize that is needed so have universities and even universities have or higher education has uh, started changing and uh, of course the change will trickle down from the top eventually schools will have to provide what is needed at the top and uh, the good news is it is happening thank you so much ma'am we have a next question for anushree navas 
the question states how can a teacher make creativity as a part of the lesson in every subject yeah <clears throat> this is something we uh, are working on recently so i can maybe have some opinions uh, what we found is that uh, some open ended tasks particularly so when we do coding of course it becomes really easy to do one of the reasons we picked coding as one of the subjects was like sahil was saying it's a lot more to do with uh, uh, these high order skills and computational thinking skills and so on so uh, if you can create projects uh, which uh, the criteria that i would like you to have for these projects is that it should be possible for three of 10 kids to do them correctly and the projects could look very really different uh, that's the criteria for designing that project that success is can be met in multiple different ways if that's possible i can give you an example uh, students tend to build like a harry potter game uh, coding and then once they do that uh, they are implementing concepts in programming like loops and functions and uh, variables and event based event based programming but the outcome of each of the kids looks really different uh, because they choose their own uh, way of doing it they choose their own sprites that are the visuals for it all of that similarly in science uh, we create like projects that tend to be you will be able to do it in more than one way so i found creativity is best done when you are able to um, like i said create projects that i i'm talk i'm slowing down here because what i notice is when we do this projects thing it can sometimes become very superficial they just uh, do something fun and the kids tend to use whatever they need to to just create the project uh, the two criteria are they need to rigorously test what you want to test and still leave enough room for open endedness another thing we do in science is children need to make explanation videos um to explain a topic like for example um, if a ball stops on earth uh, what would aristotle's theory for why it stopped be what would galileo's theory be and which one do you believe and uh, they make like a youtube like video imagine they're a youtuber and make a video for it it gives them enough of an opportunity to be creative while still sticking to the core idea so uh, i just want to give a couple couple of concrete examples to uh, how you could bring creativity in any subject uh, if this is history or geography i've seen a lot of debate activities being organized Uh, or these kinds of projects being created where each student can meet the criteria but also do things beyond it and make it theirs uh, there are personalization days that we allocate for this curriculum where the project is done but there's an entire day allocated just for you to make it yours uh, so if you don't allocate enough time for it also it won't happen so create the project and then also create enough time in the curriculum to go and do it in a way that you can do justice to it uh, those would be the few pointers that i would give thank you uh sahil sir we have a question for you so the question goes like soft skills are the other non academic skills students acquire to help them succeed in life how to incorporate soft skills into a school education curriculum like uh, what are soft skills enhancing the communication skills public speaking skills interpersonal skills how it can be done obviously kinesthetic experience given to kids a lot of learning by doing activities you can teach anybody stress management the way there is no book to teach anybody stress management until unless you are not sharing a live example with a kid or giving him some task because time management like i said we have a solution called time management so there will be multiple tasks in our solution given to kids so there are two kids two twins uh, uh, twins are there and uh, they uh, one out of them wants to buy uh, rolling skates i'm just sharing one example and uh, he has a budget but he also wants to buy a, a playstation alongside so the other kid is having uh, his brother his brother is having uh, uh, rolling skates available so if he takes the rolling skates for from that kid he can obviously use the money to buy a playstation so these type of tasks what they'll do they'll obviously prepare our kids for the future so it's all kinesthetic experience learning by doing and obviously veteran academicians giving them feedback i i wish kids immediately come to school but it is not possible at this juncture what happened uh, in the uh, last year march so we all were prepared uh, for the mathematics exam but we were given a french test on 23rd of march so <laughs> obviously no nothing nothing can obviously replace teachers but a lot of teaching aids and kinesthetic experience uh, experience uh, experiential learning these things this will make impact to enhance the soft skills this is what what will get used in the future thank you so much sir
thank you so much i think uh, what what you have said is definitely something that strikes a chord with you know all of us whether we are educators or participants because i think how you began you know that what is soft skill just try that just imagine that you know you are trying to teach a child maths without actually you know opening a maths book or telling them about numbers similarly soft skills are not something that you can just tell them about it as a solution that you know okay you are late why don't you manage your time we have to teach it through experience you can't learn stress without stress management without not involving stress or you know time management without not involving time i think that's a very very valid aspect that you have brought out we'll move forward to the next question asked by swati bakshi for amrita ma'am why isn't marks a parameter of assessment system changing in spite of knowing that it is probably the most primitive form of assessment well it is changing and um, you do know that change is always always difficult change is the only constant and yet tough to adapt to there is something called change management and it is always uh, it is it is required because change is difficult right and i think this is the it's been quite a few years since we have these what taylor gatto calls weapons of mass instruction leading us into a system uh which which you know sees everybody into you know one like an assembly line and just fit everybody has to has to move in that assembly line and and obviously we're not we're not going to function like a typical product that that comes out or could be churned out of an assembly line that's not what school is was ever meant to be that's not what education was ever meant to be uh, just remember our own uh, traditional gurukul system uh, we had the guru go to a guru with any question we have all heard so many folk tales around that uh, uh, the guru would never give you a straight answer the guru would say you know go find this out find that out Uh, and then come back essentially what are they doing they're leading you into inquiry they're giving you the right questions and they're making you think think through those questions go find out explore for yourself and you you try you experience and then you come back so there is experiential learning there is an inquiry cycle involved and then you come back and then you already seem to have the answer and then you tell you you probably come up with yet another question which you were led to through the thinking process that you went through that is our own system and that is the way we learn that's how learning actually happens how can we actually we if we if we need just clerks for the british empire it's okay to have an assembly line which which happened but then the industrial revolution is long since behind us it needed some of those things to be done it needed workers who could fit into a certain regime it, we are into a whole new revolution now it is the technology revolution which is all around us and so much more it's a whole new world that has opened up around us so change is constant it is happening and uh, we all as teachers when we were thrown into the deep end quite literally this year with the pandemic we all figured a way figured out our ways we managed right and we managed beautifully but then the thing is till then years and years blended learning was supposed to be there technology was there these apps are not new very few of them may have been designed you know designed recently but most of it was there already we were not using it we had our apprehensions we had oh no 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 so change there was resistance i think with marks now cbse tried introducing the cce such a beautiful concept continuous comprehensive evaluation but it could not happen it had to be rolled back and we all know what happened the cbse now came up with another way every year on year they are changing 10% they have been doing it for the last 3 years and now uh, you know almost 40% of the uh, question paper for the board exam is already changed it is more case studies it is more critical thinking and 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 those kind of skills that need to be actually there and therefore we were able to adapt a lot to that during this pandemic year which opened up the whole world and and opened up so much i mean um student did something like 146 student exchange programs there was co teaching happening from across the globe and what not teachers could find so much it 
if we could do this we're capable we can all of us can just that we keep resisting till we can so let's just the minute we stop resisting we'll all know yes this is what we always needed and and the minute you start doing it the minute you this is the first time i think education uh, or the classroom transcended the idea of space and time uh, it no longer it was it was within the house and it really genuinely transcended and we may have been talking since forever but this is the first time when education genuinely became student centric it was in the hands of the learner and it could not work and every teacher i think who worked online realized that if the teacher tries to make it something which is very lecture based or one sided or teacher centric child is not going to sit there listening to you for uh, even an hour or forget even for 5 uh, minutes or 4 minutes it wasn't possible child is going to be there and listen and do whatever is needed and actually learn only if the child wanted to okay and the child would want to do it only if they believed in what they were doing only if they felt that yeah this is something yeah this is this is interesting this i want to do i want to explore more about this and so on so our job was to just ignite that that spark ask that question that the guru would ask and then let them go their way come back after exploring with the next question then how this and then you know yet again send them back with another question the inquiry cycle really needs to go on and competencies therefore emerge i think that and and for that some of the tools within technology come in so handy um you can do branching questions so easily with with tools like ms forms and quizzes and so on so a, a child making a certain kind of error is making that error because that kid may have xyz misconceptions so addressing those misconceptions uh in a personalized manner has become so handy for us thanks to technology so that kind of personalization i think those tools are needed and we can use them but what essentially first and foremost is needed to give it in the hands of the learner genuinely so it cannot be a smart board with no one else smart or everyone tagged smart or stupid which either way is either way they are bad labels they're not great they're not helpful they'll not encourage growth so we need to move and we will i'm sure we are already thank you thank you so much ma'am that was so encouraging and so full of hope like we have reasons as an educator and as a parent like now i have reasons to be hopeful that is it Yeah, you have to be. Uh, CBSE uh-huh. is working on a holistic progress card, and I'm I'm sure it's 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 really radically changing a lot. And uh, uh, yeah, we have to we have to see positive implementation right. of all. Right. Thank you so much, ma'am. We have another question by uh, Swati Bakshi for Shalini, ma'am. Isn't it high time teachers are given a free hand, not limited to lesson plans, as long as he or she takes care of the learning of the child? Um, you touched the you know the raw nerve of mine. Um, and like I was listening to what Amrita was saying, and yeah, we are very hopeful things are changing. Uh, but once again, it's a very small section of society where things are changing. Teachers are not empowered. I mean, teachers are not trusted. You know, neither the school management trust, nor the leader trust, nor the parents trust. So, what happens? It's a vicious circle because they are not trusted, they are not empowered, so they are not self motivated, and because they are not self motivated, so they are just focusing on the lesson planning which is given to them. I think what is needed is a complete mindset, you know, change in the society. Uh, we need to walk the talk as a leader. You know, what exactly do I want? Uh, the team to do what exactly would i want the teachers to do uh, if i feel empowered i'm going to definitely make them empowered you know i'm going to because it's not alone lesson planning if some teachers have like great lesson plans but their effectiveness in the classroom is nil because they have put all their energy on creating a lesson plan which is to be presented to the school management forgetting 
who's more important that's the child i mean you know so i think the focus has to change it is not about just talking we have to make sure that we implement things like the nep has come that my take on it is it's a far cry 80% teachers haven't read the nep they do not know what is in it it is we are talking we are having webinars we are discussing there is a mind shift you know i've recently taken up the consult i'm helping finish school now what they are talking about we we've taken up in projects in india and the first school is opening in indore because the curriculum is so empowering teachers you know and i tell you which is a very funny incident so when when we went around you know talking to schools so the school said a lesson plan you need on today you know and i loved it this is a question you asked why should we give a lesson plan why should we rope in a teacher's creativity by telling her this is the way you're going to teach this activity only you will do let her create that's what you know allow the teacher to fail allow get the right teachers firstly people who are actually passionate you know sadly um, you know i'm sure sahil anand you everybody will agree um education has been taken over by uh educationists are not the ones who are running education you know so what has happened is it is not from the heart it's more more about admissions kitne hue hai it is not about whether the child in the school each child is he being successful and i tell you of course i spoke technology cannot change but i was talking to my daughter and uh, you know she's married and i asked her i said so when you have your baby what is the kind of school you will look at and why don't you have one now because i know people in the education industry she said i would rather send my kid to a virtual school because schools don't teach you know they they don't they they only tell you academics which you can which the child can attend in a virtual class i would like the child to explore i would like my baby like he said coding and this and that why not let the child explore these are self learning things so as a school i know schools will not die down but we need to shake ourselves up unless we empower the teachers unless we value the teachers you know we still have the hierarchy system in schools which is wrong absolutely you know bullshit if i may say use that word it needs to be flattened you know where everybody is contributing they are discussing they are collaborating and then working on a plan because we are forgetting what is the you know main focus in a school it is the child if the child is learning if the child is coming out successful our motive we have been able to achieve but that is not happening i've seen teachers who die of you know suffocation because they haven't heard a word of praise for 20 years you know a teacher who joins the school let's say at the age of 30 you will find some of them at the age of 60 are still teachers they haven't grown they want it to it's not that no human being is such that they don't want to grow but they are subdued they are not allowed to do what they want to do you know you have to be a crazy teacher to make a difference i mean i remember when i taught gandhi i would wear a skull cap and go to the school everybody would laugh at me i said it's fine i would wear the indus valley jewelry that is it is simple things you know when you, when you talk to teachers it has to be okay you are empowered i trust you you know i know you will fail but you will do something good i mean so i uh, my heart pains when i see the state of teachers because it's a vicious circle the quality of teachers is not bad let me tell you swati absolutely candidly it's the quality of leaders and i'm very candid on that a good leader will motivate each and every teacher there why the why we keep talking teachers are not good who said that have you given them that power have you allowed them to explore you know uh, 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 i mean i i remember i joined one school there was a list on my table 32 teachers need to be thrown out because their communication skills are poor sahil will laugh at me but it was a fact i said no i'm going to improve these teachers and they worked with me for 5 6 years whatever time i was there i had to as a leader i have to empower people work on their skills improve them english is not a, a thing which can make us fall okay a math teacher is not supposed to be excellent in communication skills right basic communication is important but she's supposed to teach concepts is the english teacher going to teach language or the math teacher imagine a pe teacher is supposed to be very good in english why you know so we are a very pseudo kind of a society i'm being very honest because i'm on the other side of the table we we say something we do something let's empower the teachers you see and i think anand said you see the change in the system mm-hmm. let's go back to the gurukul days 
we will we will be doing exactly empower each child empower each teacher empower each support staff i mean do the school leaders even know the names of the support staff <laughs> that is important that is important. Okay. you know the first person who gives you an idea about a school let me tell you who the eyes and ears are the support staff they will tell you exactly what is happening in the school so what is important is we need to empower teachers because then teachers can really reach you know their maximum and they'll be able to do an education system will change i tell you they will change they are loaded with work you know which is not at all connected to the teaching so yes. i think i can go on and on number i mean it's so close to my heart and that's what i'm trying to do with my company trying to change and i've trained around 50000 teachers and my heart pains when i hear their stories it is really sad you know i may be training them okay you work with your heart they say no you're not allowed to you know this is the system i have to like project based learning ask any teacher do they know the difference between projects and project based learning they you know they don't it is not about teaching them about what is it it is about giving them strategies how do you implement in a classroom it is a hand holding which is required and inshallah i am sure we will work towards it and things will change very well said ma'am very well said and i think yes you are right that you know the the whole uh, aspect of it it is so wide it is so pervasive that i think uh, any 20 30 minute session is not enough to bring about mm-hmm. that change but we need to know that the change can happen i think that's oh. what we need to realize we need but to be- we move on to the final question of the evening by aparna bharani pillai um so it's open to the panel so if any one of you would like to just address it in you know maybe a line or two i think that that would i will be grateful for that so uh, what is the position of edtech and school in years to come i think we have been going back and forth about this to, in this session especially today so if any one if you have a point of view that you would like to share please do so future is going to be certainly blended and hybrid we've all seen the positives uh, of technology we already know and uh, we we further seen the negatives as well uh, but there are certainly more positives technology is here to stay and we've all seen how certain things which were very tough earlier to do uh, have become much easier with technology and so and yes as shalini already said and very correctly so teachers are overburdened and <laughs> somebody somebody across you know from parents to school management to leaders everybody really needs to understand this and they we need to have a genuine respect for teachers most importantly built into the system i think that is what the whole gurukul idea was all about and our culture is about that right so uh, that is there teachers are here to stay so is technology and teachers have already learnt it and uh, they know it's a good friend it is a demon which needs to be tamed but we know how to tame it well <laughs> unless it is tamed it can become a demon that also we know but then we've learnt so i think uh, that is what uh, is the future we we we'll use the best of both worlds very correct ma'am So Namrata if I may add to what Amrita said yeah I agree technology is here to stay there's no running uh, back on that and it is going to be we need to really focus on producing great teachers who are able to use technology to transform education otherwise technology uh, whatever you know the effort which is being made in the technology world is going to be a waste you know and this is important that how do we reach out to those 80% of the schools which are not it haven't changed much you know you talk to so many kids i mean i saw like we talk about technology like there was this guy in bihar you know how he conducted his classes he put a amplifier and he spoke you know because the children couldn't afford laptops so when we talk about technology we have to really look at the basics the electricity problem the networking problem are we really able to change you know i, I was taking a session with professor sugata mitra i couldn't go facebook live technology issues so i think what we need to understand is uh, when we talk about teachers and technology technology is here to stay but teachers need to upskill themselves otherwise teachers who are not used to technology will be left behind and the other teachers will go ahead so you better pull up your socks and learn because this is going to stay and so, you know i can see the smile on sahil because he's saying yeah 
that is it so finally finally ma'am nailed it and uh, agreed actually uh, we we can go hand in hand obviously technology yeah. would be required to make a change we have seen this in last year we never yeah. thought we never thought with the companies coming up and signing huge number of schools it was not about revenue it, it was about providing the support providing. to kids mm-hmm. and this is the best teaching aid which could have happened so it will go hand in uh, hand ma'am so it's yeah. not like that uh, technology it, it can't be used by teachers it, it will be used by teachers only so it, these are teaching aids and these are for you only obviously teachers will slowly gradually get acquainted to it and a lot of teachers have started using it at I received texts from many uh, school principals and teachers. Uh, I I am trying to use Teams. Do you have a manual for it? I am using Zoom. Can you share the manual, or or can you send some content? So they are getting acquainted to it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, all right. So I think that concludes the discussion for today. It was definitely a very uh, active, engaging, empowering, and a necessary one. uh i think if i have learned anything from today's uh, sessions it is that technology or technology is you know like a book i think teach, there's so much of knowledge there's so much of understanding there's so much of skills to be learned and you know learned and imparted to students educators fellow colleagues as well any tool that can help in doing that effectively in a way that the other person the learner is able to understand it and apply it i think it's good enough and teachers i mean they are the best learners right so yeah i'm sure they can master technology as well in the way that that it support that will be not only beneficial for them as a professional but i think considering that you know we shape lives why not thank you everyone today thank you, thank you. speakers thank for you. joining us today it was definitely amazing to hear from all of you it was a very very active and engaging session for all of us thank you dear participants of for keeping us on our toes and asking all the comments yeah. to the right person at the right time and i'm sure the answers have been a very great learning learning and enriching experience for all of us we'll see you all at 4 o'clock tomorrow for one final session thank you and have a great evening thank you bye bye you bye bye